tell you about why I think tin is in the latest fashion in the world of semiconductors are nanowires. Nanowires, stuff like hair, a thousand times thinner than hair, which is going to revolutionize the way we make devices in the future. And I'm going to share some of the stuff that's going on worldwide and things which we do in our lab at EIFR. So first, semiconductors are everywhere. They're in your cell phone, they're in your computers, TV, radio, you can't live without semiconductors. In fact, they're so popular that there is even a comic about Transistor Man. And Transistor Man lives in the town of PN Junction. <laughs> and uh, that's got 6.02 to 10 to the 23 people. Uh, so there are things in the sky and the things. And of course, you have to have a story. So he likes JFET Girl. But JFET Girl thinks he doesn't have potential. <laughs> okay? And uh, he thinks that she's biased. <laughs> Now, if you're laughing at this, I'm clear, I know that you know what semiconductors are. But maybe everybody doesn't, so I want to be absolutely sure that we know what semiconductors are. Because many people tell me, when I ask them what's a semiconductor, they kind of things, oh well, you know, there are these insulators and good conductors and semiconductors are somewhere in the middle. Well, that's okay. But really, the thing that matters for a semiconductor is the fact that it has a band gap. Okay? A band gap which happens to be about the same energy as that of visible light that will come later. Also, we can put very, very tiny amounts of impurities and change the way it conducts electricity. Okay, Very tiny amounts. One atom in a million can change the conductivity. And that control is amazing that we can do. Okay? And with this, we've made huge progress in the last 50 years, especially in the area of transistors and computing, thanks to something you've probably heard of Moore's law, that devices have gotten faster and smaller and you know the number of transistors doubles every so often and this has been amazing okay and Gordon Moore and, you know he was a visionary in 1965 he had just four data points okay just four data points from which he predicted that 10 years later things are going to keep doubling at a certain rate okay amazing prediction has been it's held out for the last 50 years now, the important thing is this is not a law of physics. Please realize this. If you look at his paper, he says with unit costs falling, economics will dictate, minimum component costs, cost. It's all about economics. Okay? Moore's law is an economics, not physics. Please remember this. Okay? And because of this, what have we achieved in the last 50 years? It's been amazing. From the early transistors, it's from Wikipedia, to the modern day devices, from, you know, 1,000 transistors to about 20 billion transistors in Egypt, miniaturization has taken us a huge way. This is one word is miniaturization. And, to, you know, you would not believe those numbers. When Moore's law became 50 years old in 2000, in the end of 14, 15, in that year, semiconductor facilities, what we have, we made, we made 2.5 to 10 to the 20 transistors. 250 billion, billion transistors. That number means nothing to you. I know it means nothing to you. So what does it mean? We made 8 trillion transistors per second of that year. 8 trillion per second. This is 25 times the number of stars in the Milky Way, 75 times the number of galaxies in the universe. We made that many transistors every second. So certainly by now you're convinced that small is good. <laughs> okay. But, but there are problems. There are problems, things are slowing down, we can't keep making it small. Okay. And the big thing is power dissipation. You dump your cell phone battery to last more than a day. You dump it that if devices could consume less power. Okay. And to do this, we need to think slightly differently. So let's see the science about well, why are we making things small and how are we making things small and what can we do. So first thing I want to take you back to very basics. You all know about atoms. Atoms have energy levels. You've probably heard of numbers like, you know, things are too basic, you know. These are energy levels and anything that happens, anything is when electrons jump from one level to another. Okay. So if I take two atoms together, instead of having just one level here, the two atoms will interact and the levels will be slightly split. Okay. Now when I build a solid, when I build a solid which has 10 to the 23 atoms together, I build all these things, what happens is these levels split, 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 they all merge together and they form bands. And they form bands in a solid. Okay. Now when I make it very small, very small, I have some features of the solid that there is this gap, but I begin to see a little bit of discreteness. I begin to see that it's not, it's not a continuous thing here, there are actually little discrete sets in it. The other thing is, when you make things small, this is not very important for today, but surfaces become very important. 
When you have a piece that's one centimeter in size, you don't care. I mean, the, the number of atoms inside is so much more larger than the surface. The surface doesn't really do much. But once you make things small, at 10 nanometers itself, around 8% of the atoms are on the surface. And once you're down to about 2 nanometers, 40% of the atoms are on the surface. And anything that deals with, you know, how things react, how things absorb light, if they're going to be good catalysts, uh, etc. Surfaces are important. So making things small increases the surface quite a lot. But for today, what is the most important thing is not just how small it is, but in how many directions is it small. Okay? So if I start off with something which is large, which is bulk, well it's big in all directions. Now I can squish it and make it small. So imagine a sandwich where you have you have bread, butter, and bread. Now the layer of butter, the layer of butter is large in <coughs> x and y, but very thin in the in the in one dimension. So this is thin in one dimension, so it's confined in one dimension, large in two dimensions. Okay, now I want to distribute this to all of you. Once sandwich is not good enough, I'm going to first start making stripes of it. So I'm going to cut this up. I'm going to cut this up into stripes, and if I make a stripe of it, I have a sandwich strip which is long in one direction, but it's confined in two directions. Okay, and if I now cut it up, there all all of you stripes are not going to help. I'm going to cut it in the other direction as well, and I make little little tiny dots. The butter, okay, that's the part we're looking at. They're going to be what are called quantum dots. Okay. And if you want the size behind it, what is really changing for those of you who are interested is something called the density of states. It tells you how many energy states are available, but let's not worry about it. But that's what really changes. But today we're going to look at wires, which are these things, which are like these these. Things are wrong in one direction, and these are important for the next generation of applications. So, what are semiconductor wire nanowires? These are one dimensional, so they're long in one in thing, but short in the other two dimensions. So, typically, they're about tens of nanometers in size and diameter, but microns long. Okay, like your hair, hair is about 100 microns in width, this is 100 nanometers in width. Okay, and these are single crystals. We try to want to make them without defects so that we can be very efficient. So, these are this is stuff that we do in our lab that's two microns. Okay, so these are the wires that are growing, ours are sort of random, other people can arrange it and make it look a little nicer. So these are the nanowires that I'll be talking about. Okay, how do you make them? Two choices. If you want to make anything, you want to make the sculpture, you can either start with a big stone, a rock, and chisel away little bits that you don't want, and get your left behind with this. Or you can start off with something small and build it up. You follow exactly the same two routes if you want to make nanowires. You can start off with a big piece of thing, and what you do is you etch away details that you don't want. So you can make something like this. You put little, imagine you put little balls, which are very hard, and then bombard it and remove away the rest of the material. Then remove the balls, you'll be left with these little pillars. Or you can start off with my, remember the bread butter bread sandwich. This is, a, they started off with a sheet, etch it away, you're left with a little line. This is about seven nanometers. But what we do is, this is a very sort of inefficient way of doing it. You, you start off a thing and then you throw away stuff. Can I just grow things small? And that's what we do. We just grow things small. And how do we do it? Surprising thing, this is not new at all. This is why basic research is important. Basic research is important because something you do 50 years ago suddenly becomes useful now, today. So the way we do it is something called vapor liquid solid growth. This is a technique from 1964. Long, long, long time back. Okay? The idea is you don't grow things everywhere. It's very simple. You put a little bit of gold, one nanometer of gold, just a little bit of gold on your surface. Gold has this unique property in other metals as well, that it forms low temperature alloys with lots of different things. So if you put gold on a silicon substrate or a gallium arsenic substrate, you heat it up to around 350 degrees, it forms alloys, but there's not enough gold to wet the surface. So what it does, it forms tiny balls. Okay, you, you heat it up, it's melted, and it forms these little balls on the surface. Now, you supply it with the material that you want to grow. Suppose I want to grow gallium and ars ar arsenic, I supply gallium and arsenic atoms to it, the temperature at which I do it is too low that it can't deposit, they don't have enough energy to go and deposit everywhere. But there's a little liquid drop, so it dissolves in the drop. Eventually the drop gets saturated, and just like you have, you know, this uh, school you must have with this saturated sugar solution, you put a crystal and it starts growing, there's a saturated solution over here, it sees a crystal sitting down, it starts precipitating the material out, and as long as I keep, you know, supplying atoms to it, it's going to dissolve in the drop and precipitate out. Okay, and this drop keeps growing up this way like a nano wire and that's deciding by the size of this little tip. And this is the theme of your meeting today. This is what I call growing up. <laughs> okay. And what can you do with this? You can make the world's smallest transistors. So these are silicon pillars and the red stuff you see is indium arsenide embedded in it. This is from the group in Zurich. 
The world's smallest transistor is actually demonstrated by MIT. So you can look at these little black dots over here. You're looking at a cross section through the thing. This what you're looking. This is a eight nanometer uh, silicon wire that's going in the direction of the board. So these are the smallest devices that you can make. But you can have more fun. You don't just make that. You can make lots of things: LEDs, lasers, solar cells, detectors. So these are lasers, single nanowires, gallium nitrogen that are emitting laser light. Uh, you can make a whole array of them and make LEDs out of them. Uh, you can. These are amazing new things. You know, these materials are some of them are PLC electric. So you, you bend them, you generate a voltage. You want to generate low voltages for charging all these, you know, Internet of Things devices and very small amounts of power. You have the forest of nanowires in the breeze, or in, as people move, they will bend a bit, generate voltage, charge it faster. You can make solar cells out of them. There, there, there is so much, you know, once light enters there, there's no, the multiple reflection ensures that all the light is absorbed. So they make very good light absorbers. Okay? So uh, you can do this. So in the last few minutes, I'll tell you what we are doing. Our interests are essentially in studying the growth, how do we do it, study the optical properties, and try and of course make devices. So we can grow these nanowires in, in on different materials, with different, so here's for example, uh, gallium nitride, we can grow them with a triangular cross section as you can see. Uh, we have other materials like <laughs> indium arsenide, indium arsenide, they have a hexagonal cross section over here, so we can change the crystal shape and size when we grow them. Um, we try and look at the, the properties of these materials, the defects in them. So this is in a microscope. You can actually see the atoms and you can see the defects, the, the lines which are brighter or sort of in the wrong place or something like that. And finally, we like to make devices. So we can make transistors, we can make some very nice things where we suspend the nanowire between two bridges and, and try and do something with it. Um, and this is my lab. This is the machine in which it's done. Please come to TIFR, take a look. I'll be happy to show you. Um, what do we do? Just to give you a flavor, what do research scientists do? Okay, All right, we take a picture like this. So, what do you do for this? So, obviously, when you, you will see that if you are careful, you can probably see that these things at the tip are a little rounded, and these are the little, you can, these are the balls at the tip. These are the, the these were the little little. But you make observations. You see that well, they're not on the same side. Some of them are short. Some of them are long. Then you try and ask questions. The important thing in science is to ask questions. Why is it behaving like this? And then we, what do you do? You do systematic measurements. You do systematic measurements. You measure the thickness versus the length, see what is there. And by analyzing this, it sort of helps you answer questions like those gallium atoms that were supposed to come and form the wire. Are they coming directly from the gas and going in this thing? Or are they coming from the side and climbing up this wire? So all this, you can figure out how the stuff was growing by looking at the uh, sort of a distribution like this. The other thing you can do is we have cool tools, we have cool things to play with. We can look at what was really going on at the tip. Okay, I put a drop of nickel, but was it nickel? Well, it turns out that, look at this, this is 10 nanometers, I can actually measure the composition step by every 5 nanometers or so and measure the composition of it in a microscope and tell you that this is actually nickel 2 gallium 3 alloy. You can measure at that scale the composition and the variation of the composition. <coughs> okay. We can even look at high resolution pictures. So this, this naturally you are seeing the atoms of the gallium nitride, you are even seeing the atoms within the catalyst pit over here, the nickel gallium alloy. We can look at diffraction patterns and you know figure out what is going on, try and understand what is going on between the interface, how is it growing? These are the questions we are trying to ask. And finally, we like to make devices. Okay. Now the simplest device you want to make is a transistor. And for this, I am basically a materials guy. I collaborate with Professor Mandar Deshmukh's group. He is a devices guy. The simple thing to do is make a transistor. A transistor means you are controlling the current in a wire. Okay. So I put down one of my so I take a silicon substrate. I, it's got oxide on it, the blue is the oxide, insulator. I put my wire down on it and I make two contacts to it. Okay, this we do by electronic lithography. You can see there are some marker patterns. You drop your wires, these red things are the wires. And uh, then you make some gold contacts to it. Okay, and we can make them in a variety of ways. We can do either two terminal devices or we can make four terminals. We can, we can make these devices. The main thing what we want to do is control the current. So this is the thing, you use the back, the silicon thing you use as a gate electrode. If I put a voltage on the gate, I will try and either attract carriers or repel carriers from that wire, I control the conductivity of the wire. So by putting a gate voltage, this is conductivity, I can hear the wire is on high conductance. If I put a negative gate voltage, the conductance drops and it shuts off. Okay, so this is like a water, water pipe, you push it from one end and you can control the flow of water in the pipe. That's what I'm doing. Now, here is the beauty. Just if you look at this position closely, just when the wire is switching off, okay, close to the place where it's turning off, if I zoom in over there, I see something like this. So this is 19.45, 19.25, 0.2 volt range. The conductivity is not smoothly going up or down. It's, it's this jumpy behavior. 
and this jumpy behavior is because we are at a point where we can see there are very very few electrons in the wire left and every time one electron hops onto the wire I see a signal okay so I can these are signatures of individual electrons getting on that wire okay you can uh, this is called a single electron transistor around this point uh, we can play some more tricks with it but this is not the best if I wanted to control the water flow through a pipe, I wouldn't push it from one end of the bottom. I would put my hand around it and squeeze it. That way I can stop it. I need much less force to stop the water flow, right? That's what we can do. So we have a nanowire. Normally what we did, we put the nanowire on the substrate and we are trying to control it from here, far away. Okay, wouldn't it be better if I could somehow put my this gate electrode all around the wire and squeeze the thing and shut it off? Okay, to do this, we all, we, it, it's, we, can, we can do this. And this really helps us. And when we make transistors that way, we were on the cover page of a applied physics label. Because these transistors, why? So now the design looks like this. So the wire does gate all around the wire. You're not using the back. <coughs> Earlier you were using many volts to turn this thing on and off. Now in the range of like 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 volts, I can get a huge change in the current going through. Also, the, you know, this is like, look at the source rate curve, that's millivolts, 80 millivolts. Okay. So very low power, this is a good idea. I can do even better. <laughs> Here is a wire that is false color image that is suspended between two things. This is on a sapphire insulating substrate, so it's uh, in the gate is on the same side. But this is like a guitar string. It's a wire suspended at two ends. And I can do exactly what you do with the guitar, pluck it and see how it vibrates. Now if you remember how a string vibrates, this is very small, so the frequency will be very large. It's very thin, so the frequency will be very large. Okay, but it's the same, the physics is the same. And these things will vibrate at about 50 megahertz. They're vibrating in the radio frequency range. And just like you can tune a guitar, how do you tune a guitar by tightening a thing at the end? I can do the same thing. I have a gate electrode. Remember, right? I can apply a voltage to the gate electrode. When I apply a voltage to a gate electrode, what will happen? It will attract that other wire, right? Like a capacitor. If I attack that wire and pull it down a bit, it's like putting a tension on it. So you can see as I change the frequency, I mean the voltage from 20 volt to 30 volt, the frequency shifts by a few megahertz. So it's just like a guitar, a nano guitar. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff you do. This allows you to do mechanics at a very small scale. Again, explore new physics. Okay. So what I'd like to do is, I oh, told you that nanowires are interesting both from the point of view of basic physics, which is what I do, basic physics, as well as hopefully useful for devices in the end. And in the semiconductor world, thin is in. Yeah, believe me. And finally, the beauty of this is, you know, even when the nanowires don't go straight and you have a terrible problem with the growth, they still look beautiful. Thank you very much.